we've got uh, John Kiley and April Surgeon with us tonight um, and have been spending the last few days with them here in the gallery mounting these really beautiful exhibitions, um, really astoundingly beautiful exhibitions, uh, really spare. They look like museum shows in here, which is really lovely. So thanks you guys for bringing us such beautiful work. Hi Marge, nice to see you. <laughs> um, so we're gonna, this is a small group tonight. We're just gonna keep this really casual and easy. We'll walk through the shows um, with Deb on camera. We'll spotlight her video and um, ask you all to please mute yourselves and turn your videos off. Uh, I'll keep my video on, April will keep hers on and John will keep his on. Um, and we'll kind of talk as we walk through the exhibitions um, hear about what they've been up to, what these new bodies of work are about. Um, and then after we see the shows, we'll open it. I'll invite you all to join us again uh, with videos on and we'll ask questions and just have a nice, nice conversation. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask Jillian to spotlight Deb's video. There we go. Um, hopefully you all can see that. And if you are having any issues uh, with the screen, go ahead and drop a chat in to Jillian. She's going to, um, she'll be kind of playing host tonight and doing the work on the back end. So here we are, front of the gallery, looking at John's show. John, what's the title of your exhibition? Um, the, the title of the exhibition is A Gem, Alpha Gem. <laughs> Alpha Geminoris, um, and uh, it's a little bit of a cryptic title, and the show is named after a constellation um, that is uh, part of Gemini, and uh, the, the constellation is, is Castor, um, but A-Gem is the abbreviation for it. So these are... Um six fractograph pieces um, and they they're different from the previous fractograph works that you've done um, in a, in several different in several ways um, but probably most notably in that they are displayed kind of at angles um, in a really dynamic way and then also they're different thicknesses of glass why did you choose to do that well I, you know, a couple of things. First, let me talk about the, the selection of the, well, there's, there's three things that's different about this, this body of work, really. The, the selection of the glass and uh, the color and the thickness. Um, the method for uh, metamorphosis, I should say. And then also um, the stands and the way they're displayed as well. So to start with the, the color, um, you know, I really wanted to do something that was uh, stripped down color-wise. Um, the first iteration of the fractographs was all clear. Um, I did an exhibition of eight clear fractographs at Traver Gallery a few years back. Uh, and, um, you know, I liked the way that that exhibition felt, just being kind of minimal and I'm a, a minimalist by by I don't know philosophy and, and and kind of the way I think tends to be less is more and so part of it was an exercise in getting back to that uh, the difference with this being is that there's six blocks that are all the same color and the thickness is different in all six blocks so it starts from about one inch thick and goes up to three inches thick so it really also, um, you know, the hue changes and your perception of the color changes depending on the thickness of the glass. So really um, the shift from block to block is pretty subtle, uh, but the way they're arranged in the gallery from, uh, you know, least dense to most dense, it's pretty dramatic if you look at the first piece and look at the last piece. Uh, so, you know, that's one of the beautiful properties of glass is that with transparent material, um, 
you can create something that looks and feels entirely different just by varying how much material there is. Um, so kind of to speak to the, the stands in these and, and the way that they were arranged, you know, I felt like I wanted to do something that was a little bit less, I don't want to say static, but a little less rectangular. I mean, I'm still working with rectangles and, and some geometry here, but I wanted the, the stands to reflect perhaps a bit of the angles that occur naturally in the fractures. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, I think the, the stands is kind of an attempt to, to bring those together as a composition instead of having it just be a stand. And then, uh, you know, secondly, perhaps one gets a sense of, of motion um, that I think, you know, if, I, if I'm successful with the fractographs, you get that from the glass, that there's some kind of movement happening. Um, but I wanted the stands to kind of carry that a little bit further. It's, um, it occurs to me as you're talking about that, that there's something sort of similar in the way that you've kind of balanced these pieces on edge um, to the way you balance some of your very early work on edge. In fact, I think the very first exhibition that we did with you um, were the spherical forms and we displayed them in the gallery where they were like literally hanging over the edges of the pedestal, sort of precariously right. uh, <laughs> threatening to fall into space. But of course, you know, they're completely stable. They're sort of uh, playing with that, that tension that you feel when you see especially glass um, in like in a precarious position like that. Um, and these, I think, sort of harken back to that, that those early displays of your work. Yeah, I think they definitely do. And, you know, part of that is, is just, just that it naturally goes there. You know, my, my thinking on these things kind of uh, it evolves, but there's a, a common thread to everything. And intentional or not, it always seems to work its way back in. You know, you look at some of my, my early work and there's definitely a relationship to even these brand new pieces. Yeah, that sort of that idea of um, the thing that is broken is in some ways more beautiful than the thing the, the entire object before it's broken. Like there's something that's revealed in the break that allows you to see the sort of interior of the form or uh, qualities of the material that you otherwise wouldn't see. Sure, there's that, there's that. And there's also, you know, the surprise to me has been that, that people have that same sense of um, being arrested when they see the these fractographs on the angles like oh my gosh look at that that's gonna fall over and there's this sense of caution with people um you know approaching the piece and uh that was exactly the same reaction people had to the first exhibition um okay so here's an object that's already been broken and reconstructed and i, I kind of chuckled to myself that well what's the worst thing that's going to happen here <laughs> nothing yet you still have that visceral response like it's it's there it's present and that's because of the choice of material can you talk a little bit you also talk about with this work um how these are kind of a, a record um in you know a record of a physical interaction that you have had with the artwork um and that there's sort of this indelible kind of quality of, with them. Can you talk a little bit about how you think about that? <laughs> yeah, so less so this version than earlier versions of work. The, the, the first iteration of the fractographs was all a, a, a sledgehammer, um, a brand new 10 pound sledgehammer, uh, one hit and you got whatever you got. And the thinking on those was, you know, not unrelated to abstract expressionism. If you think of Jackson Pollock, 
capturing his motion and emotion in two dimensions uh, on the canvas, you know, I wanted to find a way to do that in three dimensions. And I was open to other materials. Um, and, to, you know, I'd been thinking of ideas perhaps of like building a, an overhead furnace with a particular form of glass that, that uh, you know, a formula of glass where you suspend this furnace, say 30 feet up in the air and pull the plug on the bottom and be able to manipulate the furnace with a series of cables to do a three dimensional drawing that would stack up upon itself and naturally cool and survive. And you'd have this sort of record of motion in three dimensions that way. Uh, and I had the, the clear blocks made with the idea that perhaps I do, you know, an architectural sculpture, like, like the towers that I've done. Uh, and when, when they arrived, I thought, oh, this is it. This is a great way to capture energy. Take a sledgehammer, break this beautiful, not inexpensive, perfect object, and then reconstruct it. So when glass fractures, the, the, Fractures travel through the material between nine and 11,000 miles per hour, typically. So it's an instant, indelible, and irreproducible record of time and place and energy. You cannot recreate the same break in glass twice. Uh, Department of Justice years ago commissioned a study where they tried to break glass in the lab to recreate crime scenes, and they were totally unsuccessful. Uh, so the second iteration was the thermal fractograts. And in that case, I wanted to take my physical energy out, out from initiating the fractures. Uh, so what I did was basically do a little drawing on there, very simple and very abstract, perhaps a dot or a line with molten glass poured onto the surface of the room temperature block mm -hmm. and the thermal shock would cause it to explode. So this iteration of the fractographs wow. is different in that I take a, just a small handheld propane torch and for perhaps a minute, I pick a spot kind of at random in the glass and stand there and torch it and then wait. And then take a drop of water out of a squirt bottle or a glass and pour it onto that spot that had been torched. And that's what initiates, uh, that's what initiates the break in these particular ones. So this is a one more step removed from um, sort of my physical energy coming in contact with it. With the molten glass, my hands are on the crucible or, or on the gathering rod and, and you know creating something that's going to touch the glass. In this case, it's just raw elements. It's just fire and water. And you know my mark on it is, is where I choose to, to torch it. Um, but beyond that, it's, it's a step even further removed. Um, can we watch the video? I think Jillian is going to share, has the video queued up and we can kind of see this break in action. Um, now a good time to do that. Let's do it. Thanks, Jillian. <laughs> So you can see that, uh, you know, it's, it's quite explosive. And also one of the things you notice in the video is what's reflected in the video, which in this case is the skylight in my studio. And uh, when I come to work every day, this is sort of like what sets the mood for the day. Uh, and during the past couple of years, it's been solitary in the studio. Uh, so it was important for me to, to um, kind of capture 
a little bit of the view of, of, of sort of what I see every day. Uh, and choosing this color of glass also, um, you know, plays into that. It's reflective, particularly the darker blocks are, are almost mirror-like. Uh, so you see yourself in there and you see yourself in the fractures and uh, I'm, I'm hoping you'll take time to reconcile with the piece and ask questions about it. It's interesting being physically in the same space with the pieces, um, how they do switch. I mean, and this is true of a lot of your work. It kind of, you play a lot with the optics. So depending on how you're viewing the piece, it might be a sort of a tinted window that you can look through as we see here, where you see the pieces behind it. Or if you're at a different angle, it kind of acts, <laughs> I do. Um, the pieces act as a mirror completely. They just go totally black and you see only the reflected surroundings. Um, and of course, depending on the thickness of each of these pieces, that's more or less the case. I also love how, and you, we're seeing on the video here, when you stand on like, uh, on the edge of these pieces, they just become a straight line in space. They almost go away. Yeah, they do. And even on the, the thinner ones, you don't see the fractures as much through the edges on these as you do through some of the more transparent colors. Um, so it's, you know, with the angled stands, they almost can read as, as just a simple line drawing in space as well. I like that graphic quality about them. Yeah. I was so struck yesterday when we were installing the show, um, just how like dynamic the interaction between the stand and the pieces and some of them, it really, the way that the fracture interacts with the angle of the glass, which interacts with the, the stand just made it feel like it was like falling through the space and um, it especially seemed like it might fall when you wiggled it, but uh, it it was um, it was it's a it's really neat to kind of see them falling and floating in in space um, in there with those beautiful beautiful stands. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Paolo is the the guy who makes the stands for me, and I've worked pretty closely with him for a number of years. Um, and so I brought the drawings to him for this and. It was a little challenging, um, but he, he did a great job. And, and uh, you know, finding the balance point for the pieces was was really part of it. Um, so yeah, thanks for the, the compliment, April. And you know, for, for me, the the challenge is um, the challenge on, on kind of pushing my work and what I do, and making new work is is really you know trying to do different things yet I'm, I'm pretty rigid about it's self-imposed rigidity about uh almost a formless viewpoint of the material um and trying to take w w what i've learned and what i've studied and, and what i'm um discovering uh about this material um to kind of new heights, I guess. When you were talking earlier, I mean, I guess this might go against everything, but I was, I, I've never really thought of your work in a mat before when you were talking about how it's, it's a, a full shine. I was wondering if you had ever worked in mat, a mat surface before. I have, how, yeah. How that would mess. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I guess I've seen it on more like I've seen finishes, but I'm just thinking of a fractograph. Yeah, I haven't done that with, a, I, did, I did an experiment with a fractograph that uh, I was telling April yesterday, I did a, a test with um, down at the Bullseye Factory in Portland. That was a, a matte black glass on the outside that was beautifully machined and then clear glass on the inside. And so when we broke it, there was this, this you know, um, this difference between the, the matte outside and the shiny inside. And, you know, that's something perhaps to explore as well. Um, yeah, we'll see. I, I, uh, 
didn't didn't get up early enough to watch Richard Whiteley's um, seminar on, on corning today on hand finishing. <laughs> uh, great. He's the one that I've, I've been thinking about that all day, and, and you know, in relation to the towers and and uh, also the fracture guys. Hey, Deb, can you cruise out and um, show one of the towers if you can hear us? The golden yeah. one. I was going to say you did. You have played with some um, like finishing on these tower pieces to get the light to do certain things. Sure, and you know I thought uh, perhaps certain angles on this could be pretty interesting if you took away some of the mm -hmm. transparency. Mm -hmm. um, then I always think of like for some reason I always think of old school gumdrops come to mind when I see glass that's these jewel tones and frosted and. I don't know if that's a bad thing, <laughs> but you know, that little sugar coating on them and. Nostalgic. Yeah, so. That's a beautiful piece. It is, it's so fun to see how your work has changed over the years, John, and that the connection point between each of the different series um, and how you kind of can keep coming back to these same ideas, but are, um, exploring them in such different ways. Really mm -hmm. impressive. John, can you speak a bit to the, sorry, am I interjecting here? No, go for it, April. Thank you. Um, can you speak a little bit about the balance? I mean, all, it seems like all of the work I've seen of yours really has to do, you were talking about like the finding the counterbalance of certain pieces and like even just the stack that we just saw, um, I don't know, I'm wondering how that plays in your work or how, what, how, what your thoughts on that are. Yeah, it's ever present for sure in my work. And, um, you know, I, I tell the story of being a little kid and making this perfect, perfect um, sphere out of mud and then breaking it. And uh, to prove my proof to my friends that I had made this perfect object at the age of like 10 years old. Uh, <laughs> And sort of the experience of this, like, you know, I'm going to call it a sculpture an eight, as an eight-year-old of, of making the perfect thing and breaking it. Um, and the process of sort of letting go and, and recognizing change and metamorphosis and that some things can be fragile. I mean, glass fragile, right? It's cliche. But um, that there's, there's some ways to sort of use the material to evoke an emotion that's just not present with the use of another material. If these objects were made of, of metal or resin, um, you would not have the same feeling that you do with the use of this material. And I think it's autobiographical, right? It's it's sort of like uh, it's it's you know it's just autobiographical. We can almost leave it at that, but. <laughs> You know, I, I expect every exhibition to be my last exhibition, not because I'm not going to continue to make work, but that's just sort of, it's just sort of my thinking on things. Okay, you know, there's almost this, this feeling of precariousness that I feel myself making and showing work and even having been successful at it. You know, Sarah can tell you how many times I've said my career is over. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's, it's just part of it's just how I feel and, I, and it just comes out can't help it well this body of work I mean I'm a proponent that everybody like views and experiences art so differently but for me when I came in and saw this installation it felt like well I'm going to call it installation because to me it read like an installation but it felt like the whole past like last year just kind of expressing itself and like a release in a way it's in but in like a positive way if that makes sense I don't know it mm -hmm. um, it just felt like a, a nice release and kind of this heavy weight and weightlessness or something yeah there's it's really beautiful um, it really is a beautiful installation and it's quite calming to walk into the gallery space and it's just such a I mean, it's the the show title references a constellation, and so I'm sure that is um, 
sort of informing my opinion a little bit, but it does, there is something about that looks like a night sky. Like there's a, you can walk in and just sort of the way that you look at the night sky, just kind of contemplate on these pieces and sort of find endless interest in the, in the breaks, the fissures, the relationship between the forms. Um, it's really quite peaceful. Mm -hmm. And so there's six of them and they're arranged at sets of, of two. And this is not something that, that is out there for the general public, but tonight you guys get a little insight into sort of the arrangements and the inspiration behind the titles. If you, you should look up, okay, I'm, I'm not an astronomer by any stretch of the imagination. But if you look up the Castor constellation, Castor reads as one pretty bright star to the naked eye. And reality, it is three sets of binary stars. So uh, three sets of two that all orbit around each other. Um, from what I've read, it's an incredibly rare thing in the universe, but okay, with the naked eye, it looks like one thing. It looks like the same thing. And it's only upon closer investigation that you realize that all of these things that are in close relationship with each other are actually individuals. Just like people. <laughs> it's lovely. It's really lovely. So that's the that's the sort of the secret meaning behind the title and the show that uh, is not advertised or published. Very cool. Um, Let's go take a look at April's work and on our way there, Deb, can we see the, uh, the group of four chromatic fractographs as well? Hope nobody gets motion sickness, sorry. <laughs> So this little beautiful group is not the same as the others. These are impact fractographs, I believe. So John, you can describe what that means, but more or less hit with a hammer. Hit with a hammer, yeah. All four of them at once. Um, actually, the same day that I broke all of the, uh, the other ones. Mm -hmm. um, it was a spree that day. It was a long day, but uh, this is this is unusual in that it's a, a different shape. It's square instead of rectangular, and these are much smaller than any other fractographs that I've done. Um, the, the thickness is similar, but uh, you know, it was kind of an experiment in scale to see how the pieces worked uh, on a smaller scale, um, and you know, I stacked them together. Uh, just because they look beautiful that way. There was no really concept or thinking behind it other than I, I, I just wanted to see them really close together and kind of see what the color did. Um, so yeah, these are little guys. Really beautiful. Thank you. I was, I was surprised like that they, I don't know, I liked them. I was like, I thought they'd be feel totally different on a smaller scale and uh, they don't really. I didn't read them almost as a smaller scale, actually, maybe because I'm so short, but they seem, um, they didn't seem smaller in scale to me in person. Oh, yeah, they're significantly smaller. Yeah. Yeah. I saw them there, but the feel of them, maybe because they carry so much light. They do, they just, they light up so much <laughs> in the space. It's really unbelievable. It is, it's pretty cool. And then we have these incredibly beautiful, very subtle works behind here. So April, this show uh, is quite a bit of a, departure in a number of ways from your previous exhibitions at the gallery. Um, one, in that your approach to engraving is has changed with this body of work. Um, and I think that comes through really strongly in the, in the work. Um, and then also in our previous exhibitions, we've always really kind of highlighted um, 
field work projects that you have done um, and work that is specifically related to one kind of experience, <clears throat> one period of time um, that you have spent in nature um, studying, working. And this, uh, this work um, is really uh, many different experiences and more kind of about a feeling. Can you share a little bit? Um, I guess, so there's kind of, the, I, uh, John reminded me that there, there's a lot of kind of the, the non-advertised part of the show. And um, I guess I'll talk a little bit about that since it's such a nice small group, but I, I grew up on the Pacific Northwest um, my parents are boat builders and, uh, or not officially, but that's what they did when I was a kid. And I, as a result, I ended up spending a lot of time on the ocean and around the Salish Sea here in the Puget Sound area region. <clears throat> and um, I just have a really strong connection to the, to the ocean and the marine environment. And during, I guess, prior, as you mentioned to, to 2020, I was doing a lot of collaborations with conservation research scientists and spending a lot of time out in the field. And um, post COVID, obviously I haven't been going out in the field um, with everything that's been going on, but I, I really wanted to make a body of work that talked about um, the, all of the different experiences that I've had working in the field, um, learning about climate change and what's been going on. Um, during the pandemic, I thought a lot about climate and weather and what those things mean. I mean, we hear about climate change and weather a lot in the news, but I don't know that I really have a visualization of something like that. And I have a hard time visualizing or understanding things that I am not inherently connected to. Um, I'm a, uh, the oceans are really in dire straits at the moment. And, and I think that the more that we're connected to um, these sorts of environments, the more that we know about them, the more we can care and be kind of um, concerned about them. Um, but ultimately with this body of work, I was looking at some of the most memorable experiences that I've had um, in the marine environment and some of the natural phenomena that kind of happens out there. And I'm looking at this piece that Deb's focusing on. Um, it's called Strange Nights and it is from Pearl and Hermes. The, the imagery was taken from Pearl and Hermes Atoll. Um, and this piece was from, uh, the, the imagery itself was taken specifically from the, a storm that happened in the middle of the night um, towards the end of August when we were working out at, um, sorry, I'll back step a little bit. I was working at a remote atoll in the Pacific and um, in August, around August, a lot of storms happen and um, these really wicked intense storms would come rolling in and in, in that nighttime um, just kind of incredible I can't even explain it and, and this this piece was was kind of inspired by that experience of being at a remote atoll and just seeing the weather I mean we were on a tiny little island you could see kind of 360 degrees around you and um, it was just one of the most incredible things ever um, that glow that you get on the horizon line there is so yeah extraordinary and is so evocative of that feeling of like weather rolling in <laughs> yeah. that, like you know there's the, always that that like light that shines right below the clouds yeah. it's, it's that quiet before the storm there was something that would happen where it would be this intense noise and our tents would be rattling and then all of a sudden it would just be like still and quiet and it was it was it was scary, but it was amazing and beautiful. But I really wanted to evoke, with all of the work, evoke feelings of um, just being out on sea and that those feelings that you get with spent time, time spent in nature and um, hopefully building connections to, to the marine environment. Um, and then of course the approach to to the engraving was quite a bit different. Um, I've been wanting to work on a large scale for a really long time and engraving is, 
how I typically engrave is bringing a panel up to the glass as a per, or sorry, as how I typically engrave is bringing the glass up to an engraving wheel. And actually I pulled one aside or pulled one out. So normally I've got like a wheel like this that's turning on a machine that I bring the glass up to, to kind of carve away the material. Um, with these panels, as you can see, they're too big to lift up to a wheel. So I actually took some hand tools where I, I carved away um, the surface using those tools, which kind of look like this. So this is a pneumatic tool. Um, the little air, hole, air hose goes in here and then the, the bit turns and I'm able to carve on the surface. Um, I can also use little flat, flat discs like this on a, on a, on a machine that um, would grind the surface kind of flat like that. So it's a really different approach and it's approach that was inspired by a residency that I had at the Bullseye Glass Factory in, well, I thought it was 2008, but I think I was corrected that it was actually 2007. So I, I um, I'm a little embarrassed about that, but um, I had a residency at Bullseye with my mentor Yerji and it was just a, a amazing experience where we were able to just fuse these gigantic glass panels and use these very similar hand tools to what I have now. Um, and I've been wanting to set my studio up to make this type of work for a really long time. And I finally just did it over the last year. It took me, I don't know what took me so long, but I finally did it. And it's been a really fun and really freeing experience. Um, here's another image from, this one is actually from Pearl and Hermes too. This was, um, there's two pieces similar to this that um, just show kind of a, a storm rolling in. Um, there's something about being on the water and feeling entirely vulnerable to nature um, when, you're, when you're out at sea and um, I don't know, just something, something lovely and peaceful about it as well. So I, I hope this work in all of the chaos of the year I also really wanted to uh, make some work that was a little bit more reflective and quiet and peaceful and tranquil. I imagine um, that with this new way of working um, with the hand tools, it, so I, I'm assuming that you're working flat and that you're able to kind of see the entire piece that you're working on um at one time whereas the work that you were doing previously um just because you needed to be able to bring the panels of glass to the engraving wheel you kind of you gridded them out into smaller sort of they were they were tiled together um and so just by virtue of that you were never able to see the entire piece you were working on at one time um <laughs> until you were putting it together which is quite a feat yeah. in and of itself, but I just imagine that, and I think that I see it in the work, how much um, kind of looser you're able to be here. And there's like more of a gestural quality. Yeah, I'm really excited about um, the direction and being able to play with it. Being able to kind of improvise as I go is really important or not really important, but it's, well, it's really important for this work, but it's, it's really changed my approach to the engraving. Um, before working like this, I guess, you know, when you're making a piece that's broken up between a lot of panels, you really have to basically have the composition decided upon once you start. And with this work, um, you know, I had the composition decided on before I started, but there was a lot more room for improvisation and um, I don't know, it just felt fun and refreshing and reminded me of a, a really lovely time in the development of my, of my practice. Um, one thing that Yerji always was really encouraging was just to kind of always try new things and don't be, a, you know, he'd always encourage me to not be afraid to just kind of push my growing edges and, um, I feel like this was was a big leap into something new that I'm I'm really excited to explore. It's so beautiful. I mean, the 
immediacy with which you are sort of in that environment that you depict is just incredible. Like I absolutely feel like I'm sitting in a boat on the water and when I look at these pieces. One thing that I was thinking a lot too about when I made this work is I've been kind of all around the Pacific Ocean from Antarctica to Alaska to, I mean, the Salish Sea and um, just what an incredible thing the ocean is and really thinking about, um, I don't know, just just the feelings that you get when you spend time time on the Pacific Ocean. I hope they they recall those. I hope they recall feelings of time spent in nature for for the for the viewers for sure. Yeah. The one that Deb, maybe you can walk closer to the large panel on the floating wall there. This one's quite different, I think. I also, and I think it's a really good example of how abstract this work is also. I mean, even though it's sort of clearly a depiction of, you know, a horizon line. Um, they, all of the work in this show also has this sort of ability to vacillate between uh, something that's representative of a specific place, a specific time, um, and being really wonderfully abstract. Yeah, you know, I feel like everything's in such transition right now. I mean, not only on like a world level, but on a personal level. And I mean, just every kind of aspect of life feels like in such transition right now. And I feel like the ocean is is always always in in perpetual transition, whether it's you know natural or through climate change or whatever. But um, definitely, definitely. It, learned a lot and had a had a lot of fun making the new work for sure it was it's been it's been a really it's been challenging to make new work in covid times but it's also been extremely rewarding well you have kind of a lot happening in your life i kind of right have a lot happening right can now you tell, <laughs> since we're such a small group and we can just speak personally can you yeah. just share a little bit about what else you're working on yeah so in 2012 my husband and i bought some property out in port townsend washington um we built a it was a wooded property we built the studio and we've been living and working in the studio since 2014 um and in last November, we did, broke ground on our house. So we are building a house. And of course, because we're craftspeople and we come from a family of craftspeople, we're making it as difficult as possible and we're building it ourselves. <laughs> um, we're doing everything but the drywall and the concrete work. And um, we were able to mill up uh, the property that we're on is very wooded. so. Over the last, I guess, since we've been here since since 2012, we've been clearing the property and milling up the wood and a very good portion of the wood from the property is going into the house. Um, my father and mother are woodworkers and my husband is an incredible fabricator and he actually made the brackets for these pieces. Um, this is one. So we've been building a house and making a show and living and working in the studio, and it's kind of crazy. Did you say you're you're milling the wood, like you, like falling trees and like? Yeah, we felled trees and milled wow. them. We've got all our beams, the siding, the flooring, the trim. Uh, it's all it's all from all from the property. Wow. <laughs> And Zach, actually, it was you were Deb was focusing on the brackets. Zach, my husband, um, built the brackets. He also built the strong walls for our house. It's very handy to have a metal fabricator as a husband. Um, he was tired when he made these pieces, but he he thought they turned out great, and I thought so too. Uh, yeah, it's a beautiful. It's actually a really beautiful new solution. There's some a real. Um, ease about it like the it's not overly it's hard or contrived it's just so simply like here is this beautiful panel of glass just resting here yeah 
really nice. And the other piece that Deb showed, um, Deb, the biggest one to the left there, um, to your, uh, no, now to your right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that one. Um, this piece here uh, was um, also from Pearl, and I guess I'm focusing all on Pearl and Hermes pieces, but these are just the three from Pearl and Hermes, but there was a kind of the natural phenomenon of where the light kind of comes down on the ocean and plays with the currents. And I know you see this all, all over the ocean, but um, I know some people like to know the specific location, but I, I, um, I, whenever I see that kind of phenomena of the sun coming through the clouds, it's always just so magical. But this is the biggest piece in the show. I think it's 23 by 34, which is definitely by far the largest single panel cameo engraving I've ever made. It's extraordinary. It looks, it looks small <laughs> on, the, on my screen. <laughs> Funny, it was, I was just looking at it on the screen. It looks so photographic. Um, yeah, it does. It, in person and it's uh i hope that anybody who's in town will venture out and see these shows in person because it, they really um they give you so much more in person than we can ever capture on a screen like this yeah april one of the things that i noticed and that i loved about the new way of displaying the pieces is it allows a little bit of light to bounce off the wall Mm -hmm. And the pieces have this kind of glow to them that's spectacular. That's not just from light yeah. in the front. Like even before you had the pieces lit yesterday, it was. I'm um I'm excited to play around with that for sure. It's definitely um, it's it. There's a lot of things to play around with, and I'm I'm so excited to explore it all. Yeah. So just for the folks who are watching this, the those sort of teal areas on this piece um, are there's quite a bit of light coming through that that's not just the color of the glass it's really there's so they actually change quite a bit depending on the lighting conditions as well which is quite beautiful April you posted a video on your Instagram a little while back of just the like dappled light in your studio on one of these pieces and it's uh, it just like comes alive yeah, it, um, it's been really neat to watch this work in my studio um, and, the, and the natural light that flows around. Um, and, you know, I guess with one, one other thing about this work, um, just thinking about the work that the research that I've done over the last, I guess, almost 10 years now about climate change and thinking about my role as an artist and what I can do and what that what it, I don't know what it all means, but, but hopefully I think, I think it's, it's the artist's job, I guess, to not necessarily translate science, but maybe interpret, interpret experiences or science and build connections. And um, hopefully, hopefully there's something in this work that might trigger someone to think about something that will make us care a little bit more about how we treat ourselves and the planet and everything else. I don't know. I, I, all I can hope is that art can build connections for people or remind us of things that maybe we, we forgot about. Yeah. Um, just a moment to be kind of tender and reflective and everything that's kind of going on in the world right now. So but in well, a good way. Positive. Thank, thank you for, thank you both for sharing um, your work with us. Cause I think uh, in both cases, you've created these wonderful spaces for contemplation and discovery. And it's really, um, yeah, it's really wonderful to have the work in the gallery and share it with people. Thanks um, for the opportunity to yeah. share the work. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Yeah, let's go ahead and uh, I'm going to turn the spotlight off on Deb's camera and we'll uh, welcome everybody else to jump back.
um, on video and join us and ask questions if you've got them. Um, if you also, if you're not interested in joining on video, that's fine. And you have questions, you can also just drop drop them in the chat. I've got my chat open that I, I will be okay. reading. I, I've got a few questions. So yeah, I'll, Mark, go for it. Yeah. Nice to see you. For both John and uh, April. So um, April, your works, I mean, I got an impression being English of like Constable and uh, especially Turner in the light effects is I think that's what you're capturing. But I had a couple of questions. So for the color palette, have you changed that to get the green, the, the teal behind it, or is it still the, the same three layers of crop glass you're using for? It's the same, it's basically the same color palette. Um, it's changed, it changes a little bit. These panels are thicker, so it's changed a little bit. Um, some of the panels have like a, if there's, sandwiched and trying if they're sandwiched like this some of them um you've got like the darker turquoise on top of a white so when i've cut through the turquoise it's getting thinner and the white is kind of shining through it and some of the pieces i've got like a blue in the mi middle and then like a dark color on the back and then when i cut the dark color on the back the teal shows through so there's a couple of different ways that i've should done that with the pieces, but so you cut it on both sides, on the front and the back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, and I've done that with all of my work, and of course, I always think that my work is so colorful, and it's not really for me. It's colorful, mm -hmm. but uh, this work is is more colorful, and that I've shown it off a little bit more. The catalog pictures, actually, I think it was a little dark in some of them, but they're as you can see it. It changes a lot, but and I have another question. So is is the display method final, this angular uh, presentation, or um, is that still fluid that you might hang them flat on a wall? Um, for the bigger pieces, I might have to talk to John Kiley for glue suggestions. They're, <laughs> they're very heavy. And the purpose of that was um, being very nervous about hearing stories of glass falling off of the wall because they're they're heavy so um it's not necessarily a uh it's it's always a it's always fluid um but but for the weight of some of these pieces it seemed like it some of them probably could definitely handle being being held up by a bracket but um it was just something to play with and then we'd also played with having them on a on a shelf but standing upright and we, we played with all sorts of different options. Um, mm. That's kind of um, always something to play with. Yeah, from the perspective of the collector, I have just one three by three panel and it's very challenging to, to reassemble out of the gallery. <laughs> it is, these pieces I have learned through many, many painful installations that, um, this is the way to go. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> we were very, uh, Mark, we have had, <laughs> uh, usually takes several days to install April's shows. And this was so <laughs> wonderfully simple to just be able to come in and one piece. Yeah, even the pieces that aren't on shelves just have a single bracket and it's a French cleat. So it's, uh, no more anxiety attacks before installation day. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, April, what's the cushioning material that's between the glass and the platform? Looks like leather or something? Um, it's just some cork, just, just a strip of cork. OK. Bill Traver, you've rejoined us. Did you want to share something or are you just joining again? Oh, you're muted, hold on. I'm just, I'm just stepping in again. To... 
I can I can say that uh, I can relate to all that water stuff with all my sailing. It just takes me right back out on the water on my boat. I just I can so empathize with everything that's there. Yeah, I wonder how. Um, I mean, from some as a, from my perspective, growing up on the water. I wonder how, um, I'm curious how people who do not live near a marine environment, how, how the work would be interpreted. Very much appreciated. Yeah. Makes you want to come, come out Northwest to the Northwest. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty great spot. Indeed. Anybody else have any other questions? I don't want to hog this. I have questions for John. But... Go for it, Mark. Jump in. <laughs> okay. So the the tension in these new in the pieces in, is incredible. April described them as like falling in space. But do you have different challenges? It looks like the cracks propagate almost down to the, the base of the pieces. Do you have to differentially stabilize those compared to reassembling the rest of the piece? No. It's uh, it's really the same process, you know. After after the fracturing happens, they come completely apart, and they go back together, you know, two or three times before I actually glue them. So um, everything's secure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And when do you decide to stop reassembling? How do you make that decision? Well, sometimes it's just visual. I say, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to stop here. Mm -hmm. um, this piece, this clear piece behind me, uh, has a giant amount of negative space in the back, and I, I have the glass to put that back together. And when I was before I, I, I adhered it, I actually assembled it, um, and I decided not to. So I don't want to say it's arbitrary, but um, uh, I, I just make that decision on how I think it looks and how it feels. Other times it's practicality, um, with the, particularly with the thermal shocks, there'll be parts of the material that literally turn to dust. Um, so in that case, it's, it's just best to, to leave it out. At this point in your process, can you kind of anticipate how things will break? Or is it always <laughs> a surprise? It's random. I mean, sometimes when I think I can, uh, I'm totally surprised. Like, I have no idea. I mean, I think, oh, you know, if I, if I torch it here, I th can I expect this? And so, yeah, no, never, never has been the same. Result. Do you look for stress in the glass before you um, crack it, or like, are they ever like unannealed before you before you break them, or are they? No, they're all they've all been annealed twice, um, and then ground and polished. So uh, yeah, no, I don't I don't look for stress. I just kind of go for it. So they're basically perfect. Mm hmm yeah. Yeah, they're, they're pretty spectacular pieces of material before, uh, before I transition them. It was interesting visiting John's studio before he started this body of work, those, the six black pieces um, that were used to make this series lived in the studio for like a good year or so. Is that true? Um, maybe maybe six, almost two years. Um, and sort of, just moved around and found different arrangements and um, and they were so beautiful, just as solid black pieces. Uh, but I think they're even more beautiful now. Yeah, it was, uh, I had to give myself permission to break them because I liked them too much, just as, just as material. Like I wanted to hoard it, I wanted to keep it. Uh, okay, here we go, so part of that, that process and that exercise of letting go, which is all of the fractographs in a way.
Well, I think we're past six o'clock. Uh, so I wanna be respectful of everybody's evenings. Um, John and April, thank you both so much for these beautiful exhibitions and for taking time to jump on here and share your insights with everybody. It's uh, really enjoyable to hear you both speak about your work and your process and really quite enlightening. So thank you. Thank you. And, Thanks for having us. Yeah. And uh, to everyone who's joined the call tonight, thank you all for taking the time out of your day to participate and see these exhibitions and help us celebrate their openings. So, take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.